So how are you? As we saw with our young people, it can be such an unpredictable question. With one of my teenagers, when I check their awake in the morning, I used to ask, how are you? And every day, the answer was the same, tired. So I've stopped asking. And I remember when I was younger myself, there was a friend of our family who would ask that question, and woe betide you if you answered good. I'll be the judge of that, was the inevitable disapproving reply. We quickly learned to remember to reply, fine. But fine is not without its problems either. Have you ever been in a situation where one person is upset with another person, and when they get asked, how are you, or are you okay, the answer is a highly charged fine, meaning I'm not in the least bit fine, and you should obviously know the reason why. Ironically, it's the reverse situation that's happening in our reading from the book of Isaiah. Had God been asking the Israelites, how are you? It's clear that they would have replied, fine. In fact, great, absolutely great, awash with blessings. And yet for God, this was not fine because the people of Israel weren't appreciating their blessings or all the goodness God had shared with them. God is clear how much he has done for the Israelites. He rescued them from slavery in Egypt, led them to the promised land and cleared that land of other nations that they might live there in prosperity. And from all this abundance, God wanted the Israelites to live in a way that would show their gratitude to him. Now, when Isaiah says that God expected justice and righteousness, there are Old Testament nuances to those words. Justice was less about punishing people for crimes and more about taking care of others and in particular, the three most impoverished groups in Old Testament society, widows, orphans, and immigrants. Similarly, righteousness was not just about living appropriately. It also meant that you carried out your obligations to others. In God's eyes, that you would look after those in need. And the Israelites weren't. As God saw it, they had utterly distorted his love, enjoying all that he had given them, but doing nothing in return. It's a calling that we still have today. Do we simply sit back and enjoy the blessings God has given us? Or do we look for ways in which we can share those blessings and care for those in need? And it is a joy to see this community answer that calling today with the ample contributions to our harvest table, which will be shared with those in need after today's service. This is just one small way in which we can honor God's blessings in our lives. But what about when we don't feel that life is abundant? Is this call to gratitude just a slippery slope into toxic positivity and the demand to always face the world with a chipper and cheerful demeanor, regardless of the ways in which our world may be crumbling? Facing life can be hard. God recognizes there are times when gratitude does not come easy. 
Sheryl Sandberg was the former COO for Facebook. And she had her life upended in 2015 with the sudden death of her 51-year-old husband. She wrote a powerful and moving account of her experiences of grief, published 31 days after her husband had passed away, and to mark the end of the Jewish mourning custom of Shalashim. I remember it particularly because of the way in which she talked about the difficulty of being asked, how are you, in a time of grief. She wrote, even a simple how are you, almost always asked with the best of intentions, is better replaced with, how are you today? When I am asked, how are you, I have to stop myself from shouting, my husband died a month ago, how do you think I am? When I hear, how are you today, I realize the person knows that the best I can do right now is get through each day. While gratitude does not always come easy, I'm also struck by the realization that it is often people in the toughest of situations who express the most gratitude. Sandberg has experienced this and she reflects, I have learned gratitude real gratitude for the things I took for granted before, like life. As heartbroken as I am, I look at my children each day and rejoice that they are alive. I appreciate every smile, every hug. I no longer take each day for granted. When a friend told me that he hates birthdays, and so he was not celebrating his. I looked at him through tears. Celebrate your birthday, damn it. You are lucky to have each one. She then quotes a one line prayer shared with her by a rabbi friend Let me not die while I am still alive. Let me not die while I am still alive. Gratitude underpins this prayer, both in its implicit appreciation of the abundant blessings of life and the prayer's appeal to us to value our blessings, to recognize and name them. And we can see this prayer reflected in the transformation of the ten diseased men in our reading from Luke's Gospel. For they were living a dead life when they called out to Jesus. Luke's Gospel tells us that they had a skin disease which made them ritually unclean. So they were shut out of society and barred from temple worship that was at the core of their faith. When they encounter Jesus, they are at the edge of the village, a physical reminder of their exclusion. And they know, even as they call out to Jesus, to keep their distance. These men are the literal inverse of the rabbi's prayer. Why do I still live when by every useful measure I am dead? And this deadened state of existence is transformed by Jesus with barely a word. Go and show yourself to the priests. Their marginal existence is healed purely through Jesus' intent. 
yet only one recognizes the wonder of this and turns back to Jesus. Only one turns back and praises God and thanks Jesus. Now, the other nine aren't necessarily at fault. They're doing exactly what Jesus told them to do. They are rushing to the priests to have their healing acknowledged so that they might return to both their faith and their community. But the one who turns back receives more. The other nine have their skin condition healed, yes. But for the one who turns back, Jesus bestows an extra blessing. Your faith has made you well. Now, this is one of those places in the Bible where the translation is a little ambiguous. When Jesus tells the tenth man, your faith has made you well, he is not referring to the skin condition which has just been cured, because all ten were cured, regardless of whether they turned back and gave thanks. But the Greek word for made well can also be translated as saved or made whole. So ten were indeed made clean, but only one was saved. Ten were made clean, but only one was made whole. Your faith has made you well. Your gratitude has made you whole. Your gratitude has made you whole. Because giving thanks to God has the power to fulfill us, to complete us. Robert Emmons is a renowned researcher into the scientific impact of gratitude with a particular focus on gratitude to God. Over several decades, he has led numerous studies looking into the effects of gratitude on people's lives. And the results are wonderfully startling and affirming. Emmons brings to his work an awareness of the risks of misplaced or unhelpful positivity. And he emphasizes that tending to gratitude does not mean ignoring struggle or pain, but rather that it gives us a way to look at life that can redeem difficult times. In one study, he worked with a group of people suffering from debilitating neuromuscular disorders and had them record moments of gratitude from each day for two weeks. At the outset, Emmons was uncertain. Given that much of their lives involved intense discomfort and visits to pain clinics, he writes, I wondered whether they'd be able to find anything to be grateful for. And yet, as his research shows, not only did they find reasons to be grateful, but they also experienced significantly more positive emotions than a control group who didn't record their gratitude. They felt more optimistic about the week ahead. They felt more connected to others, even though many of them lived alone. And they reported getting more sleep each night so they can't be tired. <laughs> and the things they reported feeling grateful for were not momentous or life-changing. Rather, they recorded things like being grateful to my boss for understanding my needs and 
to my paper boy for being so reliable, or simply to my gardener. And for Christians, it would appear that the benefits of gratitude get even stronger. Emmons is currently part of a team leading research specifically into gratitude to God. And their initial findings show that believers who experience and express gratitude to God report feeling more hope, higher satisfaction, more optimism, fewer depression episodes, and greater stress recovery. Which makes Thanksgiving a healthy holiday <laughs> and a holy practice. Let us embrace this time to pause and recognize our blessings and name them. And in naming our blessings, we generate a type of worship that actually grants a second blessing. One of my favorite Christian writers, the pastor David Lowe's, has this to say about gratitude. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I think gratitude is the noblest emotion Gratitude draws us out of ourselves into something larger, bigger, and grander than we could imagine, and joins us to the font of blessing itself. But maybe, just maybe, gratitude is also the most powerful emotion as it frees us from fear, releases us from anxiety, and emboldens us to do more and dare more than we ever imagined. Because gratitude is a spiritual discipline. It is a holy practice. Because at its heart, gratitude is about seeing God at work in our lives and the world above anything else in our faith, we are called simply to see and to recognize God's goodness to us. So how are you? Let's see if anybody's more awake than the junior, the, our young people. You got it with me? Okay, now we tested earlier, we know this goes all the way to the back of the church where people sit so they don't make eye contact <laughs> with those of us up front. How are you? I'm grateful. That's amazing. What are you grateful for? Nature. Beautiful. Good morning. How are you? Grateful. And what are you grateful for? My children. Wonderful. Good morning. I am grateful for my lovely wife. Oh, and you're not just saying that because she's next to you. <laughs> Last one. Good morning. How are you? I am grateful. What are you grateful for? For grandchildren. Oh, yes. Even if some of those grandchildren <laughs> might. Oh. I'm grateful for the way the sun comes in the window here and shines through the church. This is a pretty beautiful sanctuary. I'm busy destroying all our electrics. There we go. Got it. Hang on. <laughs> okay. Let's carry that gratitude forward from this service. So I share with you the same challenge that I gave our young people. When someone asks you this week, how are you? Will you reply, I'm grateful? It does take practice. Saying fine is deep in our muscle memory. But just for a few days, after the service today, over coffee, at home, with friends, even in a store, will you break through the rote habit of merely saying fine 
and shift your muscle memory to a deeper place. And I encourage you to persist with this, even if it feels awkward or clunky, and to begin with, it will. But as David Lowe suggests, this short passage in Luke, Jesus' one statement contains, in fact, the secret to a good life and the heart of our faith. Now, that's a powerful claim to make, Lowe's writes. And that, I believe, is pretty much the secret to life. Gratitude, noticing grace, seeing goodness, paying attention to healing, stopping to take in blessing, and then giving thanks for the ordinary and extraordinary graces of our life together. This is the secret to a good life and the heart of saving faith. But if it's a powerful claim, a demanding statement, Lowe's is doing no more than echoing the words of Jesus. Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. This is God's promise to us, the gift of thanksgiving and indeed the gift of every day. So, one last time, how are you? Grateful. Lift up your hearts and look ahead. Your gratitude will make you whole. Praise be to God.